Now that we know a little bit more about what makes us unique, let's return to our survey of the genus Homo. The genus Homo has traditionally been defined by its ability to make tools. These species still had fairly small brains, 850 cc's, but they did make tools, very simple tools, for very long periods of time. By two and a half million years ago, Homo, Homo habilis was making chips on a round rock to have a cutting edge, and they used the same toolkit for something like 500,000 years. So very conservative, not a whole lot of innovation in their use of tools. The next species along is Homo erectus, even larger brains, now up to 980 cc's, and bigger. This, a this animal, or this human, hominid, was five and a half feet tall. They made more complex stone tools, and they were the first ones that seemed to actively hunt. Homo habilis probably was just a scavenger who would find something already dead and then process the meat off the bones. But Homo erectus seemed to be an active hunter. It's also possible that Homo erectus was able to, to make and control fire beginning about 400,000 years ago. They had smaller teeth than the earlier hominids, implying less of a need to break down raw food, so perhaps they were the first who were capable of cooking. They persisted for a very long time. Of all the hominid lineages, they lasted the longest, one and a half million years. And even though their tools are more complex than those of Homo habilis, which just chipped off a few flakes, Homo erectus used basically the same kit of stone tools for all that period of time. But one of the really key things about Homo erectus that I think we want to look at now is it's the first hominid with a truly modern gait. When they walked, they landed on their heel and they pushed off on their forefoot. Lucy could walk bipedally, Homo habilis could walk bipedally, but they didn't walk with a spring in their step like Homo erectus. And this seems to have been a specific adaptation as a hunting animal to be able to run and travel very long distances in pursuit of its prey. So, not surprisingly, given that this was an animal that could move very far, it's the first species of Homo to leave Africa. And we have fossil Homo erectus in Asia dating back 1.2 to 1.7 million years ago. These are well-known fossils, Beijing, Man, and Java. So in Indonesia and China, we see Homo erectus having left Africa for Asia. Now, speaking of Indonesia and Java man, very recently, just in the last dozen years or so, a new species of Homo has been discovered on the small island of Flores. So this has been given the name of Homo floresiensis. This is an extraordinary find, the most extraordinary find in paleoanthropology in the last few dozen years. The reason is, it's tiny. It was only three feet tall. It had very complex tools, much more complex tools than we would associate it with Homo habilis, or even, and, and of course with Lucy. And the, here's the key thing. It lived on the island of Flores for hundreds of thousands of years, from 880,000 years to only 12,000 years ago. These only recently went extinct. So, what is it? Is it a hominid that descends directly from Homo habilis or even from Australopithecus? There's been a lot of debate as to whether this is a truly unique hominid, whether it might be some mutant modern human, but the data really do suggest this is a true species. It has a number of characteristics that even though it makes these modern tools, it aligns with the apes in ways that we don't associate with, say, Homo erectus or, or obviously modern Homo sapiens. So this is a wrist bone in the uh, Homo floresiensis, and the shape of this bone is much more similar with that of chimps, gorillas, and orangs than it is with fossil hominids, Homo erectus, or modern humans over here. The shape is more reminiscent of an ape than it is of, of a hominid. And likewise, so is this bone here. This bone is more similar to uh, 
this ape bone over here, Australopithecus bone, than it is to modern Homo. If you feel in your own chin, our jawbone juts out in the front, so we have a chin. It sticks out like this. Okay, Floresiensis doesn't have that. It recedes under here, a really weak chin. And Homo erectus also has that weak chin. So that's a modern trait. Homo floresiensis doesn't have it. Even more striking is the physiology of its arms, its chest. The flores, the arms emerge from the front of the chest like this, which is the way apes' arms come out, whereas ours come out of the side. Okay, Our arms fall flat out at our sides. Chimps and flores also came down at the front. So that's much more ape-like than modern human. In the popular press, Floresiensis is often referred to as hobbits. I mean, they're only three feet tall, and they had huge feet. So here's something with feet that are seven, and a half, it's only three feet tall, and yet its feet are seven and a half inches long. They could walk upright, but they couldn't run. They couldn't move around like Homo erectus could. So if we look at them, one of the cute things about this particular find is it's found on an island in Indonesia. And compared to modern humans, they're tiny, only about three feet tall. And it's often found, it's often the case on island ecosystems that where you have related species, they're much smaller. So you have Indian elephants on the mainland, and then in this Indonesian island, there used to be dwarf elephants. So you'd have these tiny people hunting tiny elephants on the island of Flores. This is not the most accurate portrayal because they should show much bigger feet in this little hobbit type creature. So where do they fit on the family tree? When they were first discovered, it was presumed that, well, they must have been related to Homo erectus, and they somehow persisted. Homo erectus then survived on this island, got smaller by being isolated from the rest of, of Asia, and that's where Floresiensis derives from. But Careful consideration of the shapes of their bones or teeth and all kinds of things suggests that no, they're not actually that close to Homo erectus either. So that Homo erectus is actually more similar to modern humans than either one of these is to Flores. Given that very small brain, only 380 cc's, it's possible that Floresiensis is actually a descendant of Habilis, that maybe Habilis somehow made it out of Africa much earlier, persisted, Fossils haven't been found yet, except on this one island. This is not resolved. People don't really understand this yet, and there may be more answers in the coming years. But it's, again, one of the most fascinating discoveries in, involved with hominid evolution that's been made in a long, long time. While we're on this tree now, we've gone from Homo erectus, which definitely left Africa and left descendants uh, in fossils in Asia and Indonesia, the next lineage out from Africa is going to be the Neanderthals. Neanderthals left Africa about 300,000 years ago. So about a million years after Homo erectus left Africa, the Neanderthals went second. Here's a lineage here. So we have Homo ergaster, Homo erectus going off to the side here, other lineages going up here, and an offshoot of a recent ancestor here, Heidelbergensis, is the Neanderthals. And then we're going to have Homo sapiens up here. Now, the Neanderthals lived in Europe, in the Middle East, for about 250,000 years. They have traces of culture. Uh, they were known to make tools. They would sharpen spears for hunting. Uh, they made decorations. This is a decorative bit of jewelry made out of seashells, and they would paint one side to match the other from the natural colorations. Here's a thing that's considered to be a piece of Neanderthal sculpture, a natural rock that's been bashed around a little bit, but it had a hole in it, and they wedged a bone in it to make some sort of facsimile of something, who knows what, but this is made by Neanderthals. So they had kind of rudimentary arts. So the Neanderthals, when they left Africa, they never made it much further than the Middle East and Europe, Western Europe. Now they were five foot six inches tall, so they were like Homo erectus, relatively big, and much bigger brains, 1,500 cc's. 
So they're the second hominid to leave Africa. They lived in Europe for from 300,000 to about 25,000 years ago. And then we next have the third wave leaving Africa is Homo sapiens. They reached Europe about 45,000 years ago, and it's only recently been appreciated that if Homo sapiens reached Europe 45,000 years ago, and the Neanderthals didn't go extinct until 25,000 years ago, that means modern humans coexisted with the Neanderthals for about 20,000 years. What do we know about the Neanderthals? Large brain, large size, and portrayals of them, these are obviously mock-ups, often show them with red hair. And this is kind of a cute thing, that if you look at the genetics of the ginger gene in modern humans, this is a specific gene that is associated with red hair in modern humans. It's also associated with fair skin and freckles. And looking at the sequences in the ginger gene, it originated about 100,000 years ago, and it's only found in Europeans. Okay, Africans don't have the ginger gene, Asians don't have the ginger gene, okay? Now, this very strongly is consistent with more recent data that there must have been interbreeding between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. The ginger gene actually came into modern humans from Neanderthals. Recent studies looking at the overall DNA of Neanderthals and comparing them to modern humans suggest that about 4% of the genes in modern Europeans and Asians actually come from Neanderthals. There's no sign of hybridization with Africans because Neanderthals didn't go back to Africa. So it's only hybridization involving those first people who left Africa about 45,000 years ago and interbred with the Neanderthals for some time. Now, looking at different aspects of the genetics in modern humans, we see no signs of any Neanderthal mitochondria, which, remember, is only inherited from mother to offspring. Since modern humans don't have any Neanderthal mitochondria, it suggests that this interbreeding that took place would have been Neanderthal males with females of modern humans. So now, finally, we're at modern humans. These originated in Africa about 100,000 years ago. What we see almost immediately with humans is far more sophisticated toolkits, real art, real sculpture, music, evidence of religion. Humans spread from Africa, the third wave of humans to leave Africa, going to Europe and Asia and ultimately to Australia and the New World. At about 100,000 years ago, these very first modern humans, we have traces of their artwork. So in a cave in South Africa was recently discovered an artist workshop that dates from 100,000 years ago. And it was quite sophisticated. They would use stones to pound and grind up ochre. That's kind of an iron oxide compound that makes red, uh, could be used for making red paint. And they blended the ochre with marrow from the bones of the animals that they ate and charcoal. And they actually had specific receptacles here, an abalone shell here, for mixing all these things together. So just as sophisticated as we'd expect to see in, in contemporary society. Just to give you a sense of how incredibly sophisticated people were tens of thousands of years ago, this is a place that I've had the good fortune to visit in France. It's a cave known as Le Grotte Chauvet in the southern part of France. And this was occupied 35,000 years ago. And these are the earliest well-dated paintings anywhere in the world. And they're extraordinarily sophisticated paintings of species that are now extinct in Europe. There used to be a European lion, the cave lion. There were Irish elk with big antlers. There were rhinos, there were woolly mammoths, there are all kinds of things that are painted in this cave with great accuracy. This is a painting that I especially like. This is of two cave lions having an interaction. This individual 
is being aggressive and holding its ears back in the posture of a dominant individual. Here's a subordinate that's snarling, showing its teeth, and it's sitting on its haunches, protecting its rear from attack by the dominant. And we see almost exactly those same postures in modern lions. So people were accurately portraying animal behavior with the sophistication of an Audubon 35,000 years ago. We look across these early archaeological sites now, we see extraordinary ivory carvings, sophisticated renderings of different kinds of animals. Magic in the art in that same cave in Grot Chauvet, not only are there very realistic portrayals of lions and other extinct species, but also weird chimeras, that means half animal, half human. Here's a bison that has a bison head with perhaps human legs, right next to an exaggerated form of uh, female human genitalia. So strange juxtaposition of animal parts with human parts that are associated in modern hunter-gatherer societies with shamanistic or sort of magical um, portrayals. They had music. These are flutes made out of bird bones 32,000 years ago. They used kilns to fire clay to make ceramics 26,000 years ago. Very sophisticated techniques to produce these art objects. Their stone tools were extraordinarily complex compared to what ever came before, using pressure flaking techniques to get very fine edges on very complex shapes. So what could have made all these innovations possible? We've gone for millions of years with very rudimentary toolkits, nothing ever changed. Suddenly there's this flourishing of what are really truly modern aesthetics in the arts and in music. Consensus amongst all the anthropologists, archaeologists, and everyone is it must have been the advent of language.